Welcome to Fueling Your Legacy, hosted by Samuel Knickerbocker. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a new, stronger foundation essential in creating your legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. Welcome to Fuel Your Legacy. We're excited to be here. And today we actually have one of our farthest guests that I've ever had on the podcast as far as distance wise um, from where I'm at. And I'm just so excited. We made this work. Our time, time, uh, time schedules, I, we may actually be in different days, if I'm, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, uh, as, as of right now. So that's kind of cool, crossing the time zone uh, and the, the day zone. Uh, of this podcast, but just a phenomenal guest we have. His name's Ronan Leonard, and he is a mastermind specialist. He focuses on helping people create masterminds, how to effectively use them, and how to get the most out of that mastermind to maximize everybody's everybody's involvement, who's, in, who's being involved. How do we get the most out of that for everybody involved? So he has a crazy story that I'm super excited to get into as far as and just being a survivor and determination and just creating and and determined to make his life what he wants it and then watching it show up. Um, so with that introduction there, Ronan, I'm excited for you to just introduce yourself and give people a good solid background of who you are and, and what you're about. Uh, thank you, Samuel, for having me on the show, first of all. And yeah, welcome from sunny Australia here. Uh, and yes, we are in the future. It's tomorrow where, from where you are. <laughs> uh, so a little bit about me. I now live in Australia, but I'm originally from the UK. I traveled the world for almost a decade on cruise ships, and we'll touch on that. And I met my lovely wife on the, sh on the ship. It wasn't the love boat, and <laughs> she, was from, she was from Australia. So I emigrated and settled in Australia and set my own business up about 15 years ago, which was an events-based business. Uh, ran that for over a decade and then sold it a couple of years ago because I found this new obsession, which was mastermind groups, and now that's all I do. So that's a little bit about me. That, that's awesome. So uh, with, with diving into the masterminds a little bit, um, what, what specifically took you from cruise ships to masterminds? Like what was that transition uh, of wanting to go into masterminding? Well, I set my own business up when I came to Australia because having traveled the world and, and seen all these amazing places, I then went back to the corporate grind of getting an office job and I hated it being stuck in this small little office not really meeting people and it just it just wasn't me and throughout my life I've always sort of looked at jobs and if they weren't working out I, I've just left I just haven't haven't sort of seen the need of, of sticking to a job that you don't like uh, I've had this saying for 20 odd years that if you find a job you love you gain an extra five days a week and there's only seven so find something you really like because you know, five and two, seven, you want, you want seven days where you're, you're fueled and you're energized and you're enjoying yourself. So I set my own business up and it was a long, hard slog. Uh, I knew nothing about business, thrown in the deep end, put my life savings into it. And luckily enough, it worked out. Uh, so that's, that was an events-based business. But then I hit this point where I looked forward and said, do I see myself doing this for the next five or 10 years? And the answer was a resounding no. So I, I was looking for something else that, that would keep me motivated, excited. And I came across my very first mastermind. And then this light bulb moment went off and went, wow, this, this concept, this idea, how we do, how we connect is just amazing. And I wish I'd done this a decade ago. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I then sort of followed this rabbit hole of finding more about them, joining them, and then deciding this is for me and, and I want to spread that you know, you're, this show's called Legacy. You want to spread the word out of, of something you're incredibly passionate about. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, two questions that I think uh, as, a, as an audience, you guys, you guys need to understand that these questions, I try and ask myself these questions every day. Um, and one is, um, it's not really a question, but it's the idea of, hey, do I love this? And if not, then it's time to leave you know, and, and be okay with the fact that it's time to leave. You don't have to beat yourself up or feel guilty or feel like you're letting people down. Look, if it's not working out, just, just get out, right? Just move on with your job. It's funny. A lot of people are scared of firing people at, from a corporate position, right? They don't like to fire their, their subordinates. 
and a lot of the training on how to be okay with firing people. Cause like you could look at all the negative things like, Oh, it's going to hurt their family. They're not going to have a job. They're not gonna have food, whatever. You can think about all that. But, um, what the, the training to get into the right, right psychological state to actually be able to let somebody go from their, their job is often that you're actually freeing them. Those people who are at a point where you actually have to let them go because they're not performing well enough. They've already decided months ago that the job was not a good fit, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so I love what Leonard, uh, not Leonard, Ronan is saying, Leonard's your last name. What, what Ronan's saying is, hey, as soon as you decide it's not for you, stop cheating the company, stop cheating yourself and just be done with it, right? And make that decision, be quick to make decisions and slow to change them. So that was the first thing that's just really, really important um, to, to focus on. And then the second one is, can I, like, even though he went and did his own business, could he see it himself doing that long term? And we're going to get into that uh, when it comes to his, his cruise ship life, because there's a story that must be told. Um, <laughs> but really, you have to ask yourself, no matter if, even if you enjoy it, I loved selling pest control. I did pest control for five years, loved every minute of it. But when I really critically ask myself that question, is this what I want my legacy to be? Is this what I'm going to plant my flag on and this is where I'm going to spend the rest of my life. The answer was just, as you said, it was a resounding no. It's like, it's not that I don't love it. I'll still sell people pest control, but it's not what I want to make my life about. And so both of those questions get in the habit of asking yourself those regularly. And I can totally see the value um, and what it's done for, for Ronan here. So I'm excited to, to get into that. But with, with that, I'm curious. Share it, let's share it. Can I, oh, can I share a quick story that ties, ties into that? So Absolutely. very, very great example. So I, I worked for this company in, in London and they had a lot of transient workers, people that were um, just working temporary and then going off and traveling Europe and coming back. And I thought, wow, this was my first taste of, I can you know, travel the world and I don't have to sort of stick a job for the next 20 years. So I asked for three months unpaid leave and my boss turned around and said, you're a really good employee. I can't let you go. But the guy over there who does nothing all day, who's who's still contracted and we can't really fire him, we'd let him go. So I was being punished for <laughs> good at my job. So I quit two days later and I had so much annual leave, I finished at the end of the week. So this was a Monday or a Tuesday. So I left that week because, uh, as I said, I, I was punished for asking for unpaid leave and they were giving it to everyone else except me. So yeah, I, I, I totally live what I say. Like, okay, this isn't for me. Let me find something else. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's crucial. And so did you leave from that job and got on a cruise ship and that's where your cruise ship days started? I, I got my f first taste of traveling. So I bought a round the world ticket and said, okay, well, if you won't give me time off, I'm just going to go. So I bought a round the world ticket, which got me on a cruise ship, which then got me the job the next year. So yes, it started, it fueled that travel and the cruise ship experience. That's, that's incredible. So what was your job? Like what, what was your position on the cruise ships? So at the time, and, and I transitioned afterwards, but at the time, do you want to talk about when the ship sunk? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, let's, let's just kind of build up to that. Let's build up. Okay. To that. Don't right. drop the bomb yet. Cause that's the whole, that's the coolest part. Well, I don't know. So for you. I, I, tr I trained to work in casinos. So I was casino dealer, pit boss, and then, and then manager. And, and although I don't really like casinos because there is an insidious side that there are a lot of people that are addicted, for me on the ships, it was fine because people were on holiday. It was just entertainment. They weren't there to, to spend their life savings and money they didn't have for the rent. They, they weren't addicted gamblers. They were just people that were socially playing. So that was okay for me. So it was a lot of fun. Got to see the world, got to some amazing places, met some fascinating people and, and the psychology behind why people gamble it, to me is is really interesting because those cut type of people they know they're going to lose they're smart people you know they've got some of them incredibly successful people and yet they'll sit there gambling knowing that they can't win because everyone thinks that oh i can beat the house you can't you know how else do they pay for all the the equipment and the nice lights and right and the free, and the free drinks you get it's because people lose money it's it's a built-in house advantage there's no luck involved it's all down to percentages <laughs> yeah that's pretty interesting so you started off in the uh in the casino and was trained there and then how how far into um 
your your journey in the cruise ships did did the I'm gonna post the link to this video because it's just insane. Um, but your cruise ship sunk, right? Yes. Or was yeah. was sinking? <laughs> I'd only worked on ships for about eight weeks, so it was very very green. I I knew nothing, and in fact, at that stage. I got a, the casino was quite a good job on the ship and I trained for that afterwards. But at that time I worked in the gift shop. So oh. one of the lowest was one of the lowest paid people in the ship. It just doesn't, it wasn't a particularly good job. Uh, long hours, not, not much pay. And yes, we're off the wild coast of South Africa in the middle of winter. And I'm talking a hundred mile an hour winds, 60 foot swells, you know, the, the size of a, a five, six story building and we started sinking in the middle of the night. <laughs> how did that like how did that even happen to a cruise ship? Was it just a hole in the in the boat? Yes, somehow there was a valve that was I only found this out about a decade later uh, because <laughs> it's on YouTube and and I'm in this group where people sort of, sort of talk about about it and and share stories and, and pictures. They took out some valve which they should only ever do in port. Uh, to, to repair and as a result when uh, a wave hit the side the water got in and there was no valve to stop it and it flooded below all the watertight doors if you've ever been on a ship there's watertight doors but it got an, under under that and through that and as a result there was nowhere for us to go there was there was no way to get the water out because it flooded the engine you can't pump the water out we, we were done for so so yeah it was pretty critical and the the, the the most fascinating part of it was that the officers and crew all knew the ship was sinking but didn't tell us so yeah you, i mean in the in the video it kind of explains that the, the all the people in in charge in the know they had like already basically planned their escape while just planning on leaving everybody else to sink there or what was their plan yeah, so it, I mean, we sort of found out through sort of word of mouth that well, we knew something had gone wrong because all the lights had gone out and and the, the emergency lights were on, but we didn't know for sure it was sinking and, and it was just sort of passed around word of mouth, something's going on, put your life jacket on. And we we gathered people up and again, they didn't do the seven short one line, didn't follow any of the safety procedures. So we, we had to go around and knock it on cabins because it was... 10, 11 o'clock at night to knock on cabins and, and make sure that everybody was out of their cabin. So we loaded the first lifeboat with women and children on the one side. And on the other side, all the, most of the senior officers and crew left without a single passenger on there. And they had their bags, they had all their money, they had their, their possessions and, and they just left. And it, it was pretty much left to people like myself, gift shop. There was the cruise director, there was the band. The band leader was on the bridge doing Maydays and they said to him, what's your position? And he said, I'm the band leader. He said, well, put, put someone in charge. He said, well, we are in charge. So it was, it was incredibly surreal. And because everyone survived, I can say a very funny experience. There was just so many things that happened. I took all the positives from there. Um, sure. I didn't panic. And I just, I just sort of went with it. And it was just, as I said, a very surreal experience. So how, how far off the shore, like, what was the rescue effort? Like, how'd you guys get rescued ultimately? Because the sink is, I mean, the, the ship is sinking. Yeah, so you imagine this sort of huge storm and, and, the, and the ship's rocking back and forth. So because we were inexperienced, we didn't fully load all the lifeboats. And by the time we did, we were listing so far to one side, a couple of lifeboats we couldn't drop because with the swells and everything, they might have the lifeboat might have dropped 30 feet with 100 odd people so we end, so we ended up with still 170 people on board and no more lifeboats and we were only about a mile or so from shore but that was irrelevant because in that sort of weather you, with sure. the ships you know um stranded not going anywhere so you know we were quite close to the shore which which really sort of uh, helped us so a lot of ships then came around that they were all um big cargo ships they sort of came around but couldn't get anywhere near us just because of the rough weather. But because we sunk so slowly, luckily enough, the first thing, first light, helicopters came from the, the South African Navy and they winched the majority of us off. So, yes, it was an incredibly unplanned but successful rescue operation. That's good. Hopefully those, those senior officers, did they maintain going on ships still after that? 
several of them did unfortunately and uh, i don't think everybody but yeah they they weren't really sort of punished for uh, their lack of due due diligence for want of a better word yeah i would not want to be on a cruise ship if i knew that they were at the helm and uh, the one that i was on and uh, knowing their past experience but then again maybe they learn from it maybe they feel so bad and that's they never want to do it again i don't know hard to say hard to say i don't know if i'd risk my life for it <laughs> Well, speaking of risking your life, I mean, to me, it it wasn't even a conscious decision. Do I help people or not? It just it just came. As I said, I didn't sort of panic. So right. for me, again, when I was looking to start these mastermind programs, uh, I and and I said I'd taken that business as far as I could. I took that step back, and and you talked a little bit about this briefly. Is is knowing what you really want to do and what you're good at and, and what you would love to do, uh, and. And I look back at that seminal moment in my life and realize that there was this, this sort of thing inside me that really, you know, genuinely likes helping people and likes seeing them succeed and, and, and want to do that. So the, the mastermind thing was a fairly natural progression for me because although I had to learn some skill sets about facilitation and training people and teaching people and coaching them, the, the core the core thing that I that I'm is, is already part of me was there from from that time when when the ship sunk. So it, it it's almost sort of natural to me. Yeah. No, I think that I think that's really important, especially for those who are still struggling with what is my gift? How what do I do? Right? They're working these jobs, especially in corporate America, earning just enough to survive. They're living paycheck to paycheck. They they have enough to be comfortable, but not enough to uh, they, they're not poor enough that they have to make a change, but they still see that there's something better, but they're, they're just kind of in a contentment state. Um, one of the biggest things that can help them is just recognizing the gifts that they have and repurposing those. Um, they wouldn't be getting paid, whatever they're getting paid, 50 to a hundred, three hundred thousand dollars a year if they didn't have some skill. And in my experience, most corporations just pay you just enough not to quit. Um, <laughs> and which mean what what's cool about that is what that means is that your skill set is then more marketable outside of the corporation than inside the corporation if they know what kind of deal they have and they're just paying you just not enough to quit then then if you're aware of what you're so valuable like why you're so valuable to that company and what that skill is maybe it's that you're a leader among the the people around you and like your positive energy just gets everybody else to be more productive. Well, if that's it, then go repurpose that skill. Maybe it's not that you're good at numbers or whatever, even though that's your job. And so finding out what is your unique gift and being willing to go, not just willing, but able to go out and turn a bit, turn that into a business and share that, you're always going to have to learn a few new things. But Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the Venn diagram of the two between what you're really good at and, and the mindset to say that I'm confident enough to go out there and, and, and purpose that. So you're right. Sometimes you've really got to look for what is that unique skill that I have. And, and a lot of us are not particularly self-aware. A good way to do this is to, you can email your friends and say, well, you know, why are you friends with me? What are my skill sets? What, what traits do you, do you sort of um, see in me? And, and you get those answers back and you go, wow, I didn't know that. So we're often a little bit blind towards our own, our own genius, our own skill sets, and, and even our own faults to a point. So you, you want to be a bit more self-aware of exactly what you've got. And the second thing really is around that, that, that mindset, the confidence to, to try something. And we, because in the corporate world, we do become conditioned to accept that paycheck so that it's a completely different mindset, not a skill set. It's a mindset to go out there and say, I can, I can forage for myself. I can find my own clients. I can find my own place in the world. Uh, and that doesn't happen overnight, but it's a shift. And the longer you've been in corporate, the harder it is to go, well, actually, everything's on a plate for me. I turn up, all the work's all there ready for me. I haven't got to go out and find it. And all I've got to do is execute. And if I'm, if I'm stuck with something, you know, I can speak to HR or I can get more resources. So you need to, to, to develop that resourcefulness to, and, and that mindset, which is the key difference between working for yourself and working for somebody else. Sure. And so how does your, how does your skill, your tactical skill of masterminding, how does that play into helping somebody go from the corporate 
um, kind of just accepting what they've had to uh, learning that resourceful nature and how does like what's the benefit of a mastermind specifically as a habit or, or a mindset or a behavior to really launch into being resourcefulness and being able to to take on the world well there's a couple of key habits that one of the key ones is definitely accountability because what a lot of people do is they say for example they work as a plumber and they work at uh, uh, ABC plumbing and they go oh, I could do a much better job than this I'm the best plumber here and they go out and on their own and set up their own Joe's plumbing and then what they find is that not only they do eight hours a, a day of plumbing but they've got to do all the quoting, they've got to do all the bookkeeping, they've got to do all the, uh, the invoicing, everything associated with that. And all of a sudden that eight hours becomes 12. So that's a short-term pain. What They might have this vision of going, you know, I'm going to have 10 plumbers under me. That's great. But the reality is you've got to have the discipline and, and, and work on the stuff that you're not comfortable with. Because if you're a great technician, you're a great plumber, that's that's fine in a job but it's it's not a good enough skill for a business person you need to learn new skills all around business so if your your goal is to run a plumbing business you've got to get much better at business rather than trying to 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 be the best plumber there is because the best plumber doesn't have 10 plumbers under him he's so focused on plumbing that he doesn't build the systems and the processes and he doesn't do the uncomfortable things like marketing or systems that allow him to grow so having that accountability and also it's adding context to content and i talk about this all the time we are overloaded with information these days 30 years ago it was really hard to start a business because you didn't know the information now information is everywhere blog posts white papers youtube videos everything but businesses are failing at a higher rate than they were 30 years ago so it's not content <laughs> it's context it's how does that apply to me Okay, well, I've read this blog post, but what does that mean? And then talking to other people that have either been there and done that and say, actually, just tweak that a bit, or have you thought about adding that to it and using their, their knowledge? And that's where the mastermind concept comes in, that you, you're shortcutting that long learning process of, of reading all this information and being overwhelmed or going, I don't quite understand how that applies to me or I'm not quite sure if that's the right fit for me. Yeah, especially, uh, it's almost, I don't know if you've watched the movie, the Disney movie, Up. Um, yes, yes. But, but it definitely, a lot of people there, they're great technicians, they go into the business world, and they are not business people, and as a result of that, they end up being squirrels, right? Or these dogs are just like, squirrel, squirrel, they're always just like, darting towards whatever the new shiny thing is, oh, is this going to help me in my business? Yeah, but they don't ever cri critically look at what do I need my business and does that service idea mentality habit do those things serve me in my business or not and it is a little bit of a, a mentality shift of um, ownership really and, and being clear about what you want and what you're trying to achieve um, and that's where I think a lot of I've seen a lot of business owners they go out on their own but then they they never were clear about who they are and what their what message they're trying to bring and then they just get eaten up by all the potential other things they could be doing. And so I think masterminds, that's one area I've seen them help me is just being able to bounce ideas on like, Hey, you, you're looking from an outside perspective. This person says this thing could help me. Do you think it could help me? Like, <laughs> Yeah. It's all about second order consequences. So we might go, I need a new website uh, without really asking other people. You just, you just think, oh, I need a new website because I don't have enough sales. So a new website will get me far more conversions and better sales because it'll look great. Mm -hmm. And, and there's the second order consequences of that is that the second you've decided that, um, every time you speak to a website developer, they're not going to tell you, no, you don't need it. It's just a question of how much you're going to pay. But asking someone else, okay, well, what's the real problem? Is it the problem you don't have enough sales? Okay, well, let's look at other things. Are you doing enough marketing? Is your message strong enough? There, there could be six or seven other things that are far more important or relevant than the website. But once you've made that decision without really um, checking the gaps in between the second order consequences, then then you you'll go out and you'll you'll regardless you'll get that website done regardless of whether it's the right thing for you and the best thing to solve that problem. So having that as you said, that fresh perspective and saying, look, I'm thinking of starting my new website because 
this and someone look at it and go no your website's fine you need stronger message on there that will convert and you don't and you can spend two hundred dollars on a copywriter instead of five thousand dollars on a new website so yeah second order consequences really can help you shape the right questions and the right answers yeah no i that's that's perfect that's one of the things that i've over my years in business, that's one of the things that I look for now. I and mean, even, <laughs> even to the point of, and this may seem comical, especially for you because you don't have a lot of hair, but for me, I want a hairstylist that's going to focus not on like j just the simple things, but w what is going to help me? I don't just need a haircut, right? I could just go get a haircut by anybody, but I want somebody who's going to help me have have a haircut that's going to offer the trust have the strong strengthen the message of the haircut not do i need a haircut or not yeah do you need a website everybody needs a website but how do we make the website or the haircut maximize the, the usage out of that with the same cost rather than just going paying somebody 25 dollars? how do i pay the right person 25 dollars to get the right thing on my head rather than just anything on my head mm. And I've, I've built in this half an hour a week of thinking time where I think about a problem and, and I just sit down there and, and, and work through it. And you just keep on asking the question and ask it a little different way so that at least before you go ahead and go, I'm going to get a new website or I'm going to do Facebook ads or whatever you said that shiny object syndrome is, you just stop and think about, okay, what's it going to cost me? If I'm spending all my time on here, then I'm not doing something else. Is this definitely the right, the right solution for me? And what are the, what are the downsides? I call it a pre-mortem. So instead of doing a post-mortem when the patient's died and, oh, what went wrong? Or actually, we didn't find out that he had... <laughs> this problem we didn't know about it until it was too late so you can always do a pre-mortem where you you start to plan something and okay that's great and we all focus on on what we think is going to happen we think that new website is going to get us twice as many leads or conversions and instead you think about the pre-mortem what could go wrong okay i could hire the wrong developer it could they could quote me five thousand dollars but then then something else goes wrong and it's going to end up ten thousand dollars it's going to take me so much longer than i anticipated um, all these other second order consequences all flow into that and it helps you make a better decision to say, actually, I'm aware of all the consequences, all the things that could go wrong. I still want to go ahead because I still think that is the best option. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's really awesome. So how do you go about, because obviously there's a lot, well, I shouldn't say obviously, there's a lot of people who listen to this podcast from different areas of life. Some are mothers, some are uh, mothers who are working, some are stay-at-home moms, some are business professionals, some are executives, everybody's in, in a really different position in their life. And, and thus their mastermind may be different. What they, what they need out of a mastermind group is going to be different. Um, how do you go about making sure that the mastermind you're creating and you're selecting for yourself is actually the one that's going to serve you the best? Well, you won't really know a hundred percent until you're actually in it because it's a little bit like, seeing someone's CV look great on paper and then you hire them for the job and then they're terrible, uh, but they look <laughs> great on paper. <laughs> so it is one of those things. It's same as hiring a coach. You really don't know. And it's a good fit until you sort of get in there. You are looking for like-minded people, uh, people that are genuous and actually want to give first and have that reciprocity gene in them because we've all met those, those takers, those people that want to take from you. We've had friends that are like that and you know, you're constantly being the one that, that does all the work and then eventually they're not your friend anymore because you know they, they suck too much. Uh, you can start one yourself, especially if you're starting out, you don't have a lot of money. Just find a couple of other people that you admire. They might be, uh, they might be friends of friends. Just ask around your network. They do say your network is your net worth. And one of the, my, one of the, the quotes that really resonated with me when I first started ma masterminds was the Jim Rohn one is that you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Mm -hmm. So when you look around and it sounds a little bit harsh at first, you go, well, are you saying that my friends and my family aren't, aren't, aren't that good? No, we're just saying, have a look and millionaires hang around together, billionaires hang around together. So have a look in your network and, and find someone or a couple of people who are just one level up. You know, there's no point trying to connect to someone who's a, a millionaire or a billionaire when you're first starting out. There's no value exchange what they teach you would be high level concepts you're not ready for and you can't help them at all. But if you can find someone that's just a little bit above you and, and, and I call it spiraling up. So you get to that level and you look for people, the next level up and the next level up. So you'll spiral up uh, because all these overnight successes don't happen. 
So when you're first starting out and early on, just find someone who's just a little bit ahead of you, knows a bit more than you, and you can and you can still add value to them because you can be their accountability partner. You can buddy up with them. You can try and help them and support them. And, and, and you'll definitely be able to give some value to other people as well. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's huge. I would actually listen to, so two things I grabbed from that just really quick um, is one, if you've ever read or, or watched on YouTube, the Born Rich um, class, I guess, set, uh, seminar by Bob Proctor, that was something that helped me understand, look, there's all, because I'm me and I have my own unique experiences, I always can add value to any conversation that I'm in. Um, so having confidence that you can level up, you can go to somebody even that, that's, that's more accomplished than you. And because you're different than them and you have your own unique experiences, there's some level of value and perspective that you can offer anybody. And so ne never be afraid to ask f for that. But, um, wow, I forgot the other thing I was going to say. So that's, that's all that. <laughs> no, that, that's, it's just really important to think about, oh, this is what I was going to say. Sometimes you look around and your family is not the people you want to be hanging around in those, those areas, right? So that you're not, you're, when you're saying, oh, you're saying my, my family's not that great. It's not that they're good or bad. They just may not be the right people for your objectives. And you can be conscious of that and choose a per, like percentage and, and portion of time to spend most of your time with people who are, um, people you're striving to be like, and then obviously you're not going to just di disown your family. Hopefully there's a few people, few, uh, religions that uh, would suggest to do that. I'm not suggesting that. I think that <laughs> it's okay to still love your family and associate with them, but, um, just be conscious of uh, the, the, the worst thing happens because I work in finance and the worst thing is when you, you suggest something to somebody and they're all excited about it. And then their uncle Joe comes in and says, well, that's not how I did it when I was your age, so you shouldn't do it. It's like, well, okay, let's just ask one critical thinking question. Does your Uncle Joe have even close to the life that you want? Yeah. And if not, then don't, like, you can still love him, but it doesn't mean you have to t take his advice. If he has nothing that you want, why would you take his advice? <laughs> um, and it's, it's just a good critical thinking question. Does a person giving me advice, does a person giving input to, to my life have what I want? because they're not paying my bills. Nobody's going to pay my bills except for me. So I've got to choose and protect my time and protect my associations as much as possible um, because I'm the one who's ultimately responsible for my, my life. Yeah, we talked earlier about the, the mindset of being uh, owning your own business versus being paid by somebody. And a couple of years ago, I was at a party and, and this girl that I've known for, for over a decade or so, she knows that I'm self-employed and she said, oh, you know, that must be so scary being self-employed. I could never do what you do. And I said, no, the scary part is what you do is, is mm -hmm. working for these corporations where if they don't make 20 million that year or 50 million, they'll get rid of the third of the workforce because they're not profitable enough. So you, uh, you're relying on somebody to, 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 to hand you a paycheck every single week and you get used to that. And then 10 years later, all of a sudden, if you're made, your position is made redundant, and you've got to go out and find another job uh, and an industry that might be changing and, and fewer jobs, then you're the one that is in danger, not me. So I'm building up a skill set and, and a resilience and an, and an ability to find my own revenue, albeit times, at, at, you know, struggle at times, but that's a resilience gene that I have that you just haven't built up. Right. Yeah. And that, that's what's crazy is a lot of those, those people who are going to say that to you, they can't even fathom what like your response. They're like, no, they're like it, it doesn't compute that they're actually in a less secure position because it's been so indoctrinated to them. And until they, until the penny drops, it's really difficult to like get the message across. So like, okay, I actually love where I'm at and I like being able to create my own income. Even if I have to work twice as hard to earn my income, I'd rather, work twice as hard for the same amount of income because I know that I can always earn this income. You have that income until they decide that you don't have that income. Yeah. It's just a mindset shift. Just how you, how you look at, how you look at something, how you perceive it. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So ne next question really is what do you consider your biggest and greatest success 
um, that, that you've achieved up to this point? I don't think there's any one particular one. When I had my previous business had staff, it was always nice to, to give them work. So that I, you know, I enjoyed that, but I also, one of the, one of the best things I loved about my previous business is that it, at the end of the night, the clients would come up and they would, they would grab my hand and shake it and go, thank you. That was the best party we we've ever had or ever been to. That was amazing. So that's that intimacy of, of clients thanking you was, was, was pretty amazing. That was what really what sort of fueled me. And, and you go back to the corporate world, your boss hardly ever, if ever at the end of the day says, you did a great, you did a great job today. <laughs> Thank you. And shakes your hand. So that was really good. But in the, when we're talking about masterminds for me now it is seeing that light bulb moment where people learn. And I, I, I would never have considered myself a teacher before and I could never teach children <laughs> or even sort of teenagers. I look at that, that must be the toughest job in the world. You know, the pay that, teachers earn for what they do uh, that's that's a vocation that's not a job but for me seeing people when I teach people how to run their own masterminds and that light bulb moment that they can impact other people and they can pay it forward and it's the you know teaching them how to fish scenario where you 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 give them a skill set that they can then go on to use it again and again for me now that's that's the fuel that that fires me yeah, no, that, that's awesome. I think that that's important is recognizing uh, it's, it's recognizing the little wins and recognizing the things that um, you consider a success because that fuels you into going and chasing more of whatever you deem a success. And so that's, it's just a really great question that can always ponder on for, for everybody. What, what was my greatest success today? What was my greatest success this week, this month, this year, so far in my life? What, what have I accomplished that I've been so successful in? Um, so let's let's jump to a story here. Um, the the first time, like, I guess, tell us the story of your biggest naysayers, and then how you silenced them in your mind to just continue to excel at your your vocation. Uh, probably even about three years ago, I had somebody that said to me on social media, "Oh, you've gone from blackjack dealer to mastermind person." Um, Oh, isn't that isn't that weird or isn't that wrong? Something along those lines. So, and I and and I and I thought about it for a while, and I was I was ready to get sort of quite sort of defensive, and then I just took that step back and said, well, you know, you don't even know anything about me. Uh, I wasn't a blackjack dealer. I I ran uh, an a, an Australia wide events company for thirteen years, three hundred events a year. Uh, you've taken one word out of my my bio and and another word and connected the two and in your own mind you've not seen the the gap between there uh, so so that was that was one of those things that you you just sit back and say okay well um, you, you've made this assumption about me without really sort of sort of knowing me and and I find that you have to be a couple of years ago I I listened to this book called Psycho Cybernetics and it sort of changed the way I think about the world and I think about myself more importantly, because for most of us who are, who are struggling and every single mastermind I've been in, I don't care whether you are turning over $50,000 a year or, or 5 million, we all bump up against these limiting beliefs, these, these doubts and these fears and these problems of, you know, I want more. We, we're goal striving people. And the idea that is if you can let go of those as much as possible and you can, you can just understand your, your, your true worth and, and, and that takes, it takes quite a bit of energy and effort and almost training. You've got to let go of your ego. Um, I actually meditate every day now for the last four years. You've got to find ways to, to ensure that you like yourself first because that is the hardest part to, to be comfortable in your own skin, like the fact that you've got no hair and it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and from there, then, you know, your life is so much better, regardless of how much money you earn or how successful you are. It, it really just comes down to that. And if you ask anybody, if they're honest with themselves, that they'll, they'll know that, that success isn't uh, this having a mansion and a yacht and all those things. It's far more intrinsic in us than that. 
So it's finding that that first part of actually liking yourself and what you do and who you are. Yeah, no, I actually, I completely agree. It's one of the things that I spend a lot of time on. And one of my favorite phrases is you have to identify your identity. Um, and it's so interesting that, that, that no matter who you are, no matter how much money you make, you may just have a higher frequency or higher expectation. But ultimately, I think you, you nailed it right on the head. We all are going to come across um, the feelings of, we, are we good enough? Are we, are we, do we really deserve more, but we want more? And learning to identify yourself takes uh, an extreme amount of vulnerability to, to actually let go of your ego. And you don't even have to be vulnerable to anybody else. But even if you were to try and just sit down and write down, honestly, like, say you're going to burn these papers after, so it like nobody's ever going to see this, but write down on a piece of paper, honestly, how you feel about yourself. Like, be as, be as graphically descriptive as you can about how you feel about yourself, all the bad and all the good and all the love and all, the, all of it. Just, like, be vulnerable to yourself and allow yourself to feel uh, and recognize that all those feelings are all coming from you. They're not somebody else's opinion of you. They're how you feel about you. And once you break that down and, and you really identify who you are, it's so much easier to go out and take risk. It's so much easier to go and expand your mind and feel confident no matter who you're talking to because you know who you are. And that I think is often the biggest challenge that I've seen happen uh, with, with entrepreneurs and just even, even uh, relatives or family members, they aren't really willing to accept who they are yet. And that creates a lot of turmoil and, and lack of action, ultimately, as far as progression goes. So I think you nailed it right on the head there. Yeah, exactly. It really ties into the, to, to the mindset thing. We all, so mindset is almost a cliche these days. It's all about mindset. And people go, yeah, yeah, I know that. But until you actually start to work on it, and I mean work on it, not just read a blog post and go, oh, yeah, I know all about mindset. I, I, I'm, I, I'm across that heard it so many times totally understand it it's only when as you said you either write that down on a piece of paper or you sit down and go what are my limiting beliefs are they are they real uh, can i address those it really is this true can i ask someone else whatever it takes to to, to 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 take the steps to work on it and to to recognize those things and 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 it's only then when you see that sort of change so you don't know anything just by reading something it's only when you actually do something that you actually learn and learning doesn't happen until change occurs so if nothing changes you haven't learned anything so if you read a blog post that tells you hey to, to get a better mindset you really should be checking in with somebody else or you really should be journaling each day or whatever it is if you've done none of those things then you haven't really addressed your mindset and you haven't learned anything yeah i completely agree and i think that's where most people are going to get held up is the the thinking that they know it all i had this problem really bad with my childhood with my family we were raised in as far as like actual things we had we were pop we were in poverty i'm the seventh of 11 kids no money my parents were pizza drivers we ate a lot of old pizza we had some donations from the church that we went to we had so don't we used government assistance i mean it was pretty bad and we were taught as far as like what we read and the books, we were all homeschooled. So the things we were read, things we were taught were all about abundance, all about growth and money and income and business ownership and all these things, entrepreneurial stuff. And so while we were taught mentally success, we were modeled and raised in poverty. And because of that, then when we go and hear more of this success stuff, when we read it in a book or read it in a blog post or whatever, it's, we have to consciously say, okay, I'm going to take a new fresh look at that because it's really easy for us to be like, yeah, I, I was raised with all of that and it didn't work because we're still in poverty. It's like, no, you didn't apply it though. Like, yeah, we read it all. Yeah, we studied it, but like we didn't model it. And if we had modeled it, our life would look differently. And so it's really interesting. The word associations between mindset or these things, we hear it and we're like, ah, tune out rather than really being willing to suspend all previous belief and take a, a valid look at something new. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and I think probably the best person who sums it up is Robert Kiyosaki, the rich dad, poor dad. And it's just sometimes just a couple of phrases, I can't do that, or that's not me, or I don't know that. And when you build up a habit, it is you. So for example, as I said, four years ago, I started meditating. 
So now I can tell everyone I, I meditate because I've meditated every single day for four years. Uh, but only by doing it can then you then actually say. So it's about building those habits. And look, you'll fall, you'll fall down. We all do. We all go, I've got this habit of going to the gym four times a week and then it drops off. But it's, mm. it's, not, it's getting back on the horse and saying, okay, I, I'm just going to be consistent. So every successful person I know has a consistency that they do things, they do things well and they do them consistently. And that's how they get where they got to where they were, not through one lucky break, or most of them, not through uh, being smarter than other people, but finding something that works and, and consistently working, working at that. And, and all that is really is habits and goals. And, and when we talk about a goal, I've got this goal to be blah, 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 rich. I've got this goal to run a marathon, whatever that is. Your rituals and your habits trump your goals every single time because they're the, they're the building blocks. They're the foundation that will, will get you there. So when you identify good habits, and, and they're all just very small. So for example, if it's losing weight, they're just very, very small uh, choices you make all the time, whether it's sugar, whether it's uh, fat, whether it's eating the wrong thing, or whether you decide to exercise or not. We make hundreds and hundreds of decisions every day. And just by making consistently um, slightly smarter ones, they don't have to be huge. You don't have got to suddenly run... 20k or that day or you haven't got to um only eat 600 um uh 600 calories you've just got to find some consistency that that works with you and then that becomes you and, and you 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 become that person mm -hmm. yeah and then you just always have to be leveling up as well like once you once you become person that the new person then you can say okay what's the next step how do i get better how do i get better how do i get better um, so, and that's what I'm curious about. What, what is your, what do you feel like is holding you back from the next level? What do you feel like is just kind of keeping you away from reaching your next level? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know if I've even sort of thought about that recently. Uh, I, I think I'm always trying to micro level up rather than make the, the big leap. So I talked about the cold showers that I've just started. I talked about the, the 30 minute thinking time that I've only been doing for about three months. So I'm always looking to um, small improvements and, and continue to do that. Uh, so I still bump up against my, my fears and doubts, nowhere near as many as, or as often as I used to, but they're, they're still there. They, they don't go away. They're just, they're just different ones, but you address them and you knock them over one at a time. Uh, one of my favorite books is the obstacle is the way people always think that, when I get this new promotion, I'll be happy. When I get this new car, I'll be happy. When I get a bigger house, I'll be happy. And we defer our happiness. You know, your happiness is right now, or you're trying to be as happy as you can in the moment right now. Uh, and, and the rest will take care of itself if you've got all those other mechanisms in place. So I don't know if I've answered your question. I, I, I might need to go and think about that one. <laughs> Yeah, maybe take a 30 minute thinking session. Uh, no, but I, I think that's important. Like hey, what, what, when we are able to identify what's holding us back from our next level, then the, the, the objective, at least for me asking that is to ultimately assist you in, in reaching your next level, right? Once, if you can articulate and define, hey, this is what's holding me back, then the, the next uh, natural follow-up question is, okay, well, why, why haven't I done it? Why, what's, why haven't I done that? Like, that's what, if that's the only thing that's holding me back from the next level and more, more exposure, more money, what, whatever you want more of, right? Better relationship. Um, if, if there's only one thing that's holding you back, or at least you can say this is the number one thing. Yes, there's probably a list of things, but this is the number one thing that's holding me back from the next level. How much is it worth to just take a day or two days or whatever it takes to knock that out? And how much, if that's the number one thing that's going to, create the biggest impact, why are we not focused on that every day to, to get that knocked out as soon as possible, right? And so that's why I asked the question, um, what, what's holding you back so it helps people launch into, okay, well, if that's what's holding you back, let's, let's go get it done then. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And, and I will definitely spend some time uh, thinking about that one. So just so that I've got my next level on my radar and I can, as you said, I can sit down and work towards that. Yeah. Awesome. So Ronan, where, uh, do, do you coach people all over the world? Where is your coaching primarily? Well, I mean, it seems like some of it's online or a lot of it's online, but how do people, if somebody wanted to coach with you, how would they get a hold of you? How would they get in touch with you? 
Yeah, it's all online. So I, I run two different programs. I, I teach people who are self-employed professionals how to run their own masterminds, how to package up. I call it return on intellect. So we all know all this stuff and we're, we're good at what we do and we're great in that space. And then we reach a point when we go, okay, I don't necessarily need more customers at this price. I, I, I really, to gain authority, you need to have some kind of higher level training, like a mastermind that A, helps you teach other people that want to know what you already know, that want that shortcut. And also it improves your return on intellect that you're not, you don't just have one delivery model of giving your expertise out. So for example, um, trainers train, accountants uh, crunch your numbers, chefs cook, and copywriters copyright. But when you've been in the business for 10, 15 years, you want to be able to package that up into, into something that will, will teach others. So that's the return on intellect, I call. Uh, so this is all online. And then Mastermind's the same. I have people all over the world that say, I'd love to um, work through my where are my goals, where am I at, how can I get to where I am and, and, and get that support and advice and, and help. Uh, but all over the world, we're in a global economy. You know, we, we've connected here at a time that's you know, pretty good for both of us, first thing in the morning for me and it's probably late afternoon for you. So yeah, there are a couple of times that don't work out in some countries, but for the most part, you can pretty connect, much connect to anybody around the world and find a time that works for, for, for you. Yeah, even if it's in another day. You know, exactly. you got to meet in the future. Well, let's meet in the future. No, I think that's so cool. Uh, and I, I think it's so true. And it kind of goes back to the idea that you can, no matter what it is, right? The cook is cooking or the accountants being an accountant, whatever your skill is, whatever job you're performing right now, if you feel like you don't like what you're doing because you're working for somebody else or it's just not fulfilling, find out what specifically about what you're doing is working for you and, and, find a way to monetize it, find a way to help other people with that one skill. So if you're just a really good people person and that's what makes you good at sales, maybe, but you don't like sales, teach people about how to be good, good, pe good people people. <laughs> and, and that might be the thing that you can train on and monetize that side of it uh, and do something that you love doing rather than something you hate doing, but still using the same skill. Yeah, absolutely. There's a book called, um, how to be more likable, likability, something or other. So yeah, it could be just that one tiny thing that you're known for, that you're a genius. And, and uh, it's always good to double, double check though, and that there is a market for that. Some people sort of have this great idea that skill set, you really want to make sure that it's a, it's a viable one. And you can do that reasonably easy without having to quit your job. You can start to ask people, you can do a couple for free in exchange for testimonials. You can build up that, that skill set and, and refine it. And then, and then take the leap and go, okay, there's something in this. Uh, I'm going to pursue this further. Sure, sure. I mean, I, I have a, a friend who they, her and her son, well, her son was just fed up with his job, came home, fed up with his job, and he wants to be a chef, actually. And so this Valentine's Day, they just decided they'd try something out that was never, they'd never done it before, never heard of anybody doing it, but just a pop-up restaurant. They turned their house into a restaurant and over the three days weekend of Valentine's Day, um, they served f a five course meal to over 150 people in their house, provided entertainment, um, created a menu, got some other chefs involved to, to cook in the house. And, if, and it worked for a day. Maybe it's not something that's sustainable for a long time to have a pop-up restaurant in your house, but it worked for a day. I mean, why, why not try it out? Try out being a chef. See if you like it. See if you enjoy the whole process of doing that, yeah. you know, and anything can work for a day. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> so, 150. That, that's fabulous. And they must have been, uh, they, was, they would learn so much when you test yourself like this, you learn so much about yourself. And, mm -hmm. and again, we talked about those, those mindset, a lot of those negative things, I can't do it, or what if nobody turns up, or I'm not really a cook, you know, I've never trained. You then start to, to break down a lot of those barriers that you've self-imposed. Yeah, no, absolutely. So here's the final question. But before I ask, I, I want to know where can, where can my audience find you? What's better, Facebook, Instagram, your website? What's the best place to get a hold of you? Definitely find me on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. So Ronan Leonard, the mastermind guy, or my website is eCountability.io. You can find me there. 
Okay. Awesome. Well, I'll have, and we'll have links to those in the show notes here. So just be aware that they're there, but we definitely want to make sure that you have the opportunity to get more content from Ronan and he's awesome. Also, do you have a YouTube channel? Uh, I, I'm about to start one. I think I've been thinking about it. It ties into your question of, of what sort of next. And uh, I've got all of these uh, ideas and, and information and, and, and teachings. And I think I'm just going to chop them up into short videos. So I don't at the moment, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm seriously contemplating as my next level up, what should I do? And I should just be providing more educational videos, just short things on a habit formation, mindset, uh, things that I've learned just to sort of uh, chop it up in, in more education. As I said, people don't necessarily want more content. They prefer context. So when I when I teach, I try and give an example. So I'll go da 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 da, and here's a good example of of where this might work. Right. So that's yep. what I'm hoping to do. That's awesome. Sounds great. I'm excited for that to uh, to to view that. Um, so the final question is, Ronan. Now you're dead. You're you there three or four generations away. Your great 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 grandchildren are talking about you. What would you want them to be saying? about your life and what you accomplish? What do you want your legacy to be? Oh, that's a good one. I would really just say it's just around the idea that we've reconnected a little bit. And I don't know that that will happen with social media and the way uh, technology is going. I do believe that we, we've lost a bit of our tribe. We're, we're not really deep enough connected to people. I think social media is a bit of a a misnomer because it's not particularly social for a, for a lot of people. Uh, so, so reconnecting a little bit more to having deeper connections with a fewer people rather than having 5,000 friends on Facebook or 20,000 people following you on, on Instagram that, but you know, spending all your time in stuck on a screen. So it would be that the people have uh, gone back to connecting a little bit more. So you, just, you would hope that people remembered you as somebody who focused on connection with others. Yes. Cool. Awesome. Well, I'm excited for that. I think that that's a very, very real possibility. Just seeing, ha having conversation here, working um, to get together on the podcast and having read your story. It, it's incredible. And I love what you're doing. I'm excited for people to go and check that out on, on LinkedIn and go to your website. And then once you have your, your YouTube video up, that's going to be exciting as well. So uh, thank you so much for your time. All of, the, all of those who are listening, if you guys will take a screenshot while you're listening and tag Ronan and my, myself in it on Facebook or Instagram or, or LinkedIn, wherever you post it, um, then we can give you a shout out on the next episode of Fuel Your Legacy. And with that, uh, definitely go check out just a quick, quick service, public service announcement, I guess. Um, go check out my website, samnickerbacher.com, and you'll be able to have access to my ebook there. And then also, um, if you'd like to hear the most recent Ed Milet, um, conference speech that I went to, then just direct message me and I will be able to send you out a link for that. So thank you so much. And we'll catch you next time on fuel your legacy. Thanks for joining us today. If what you heard resonated with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me so I can give you a shout out on the next episode. And thanks to all those who have left a review. It helps spread the message of what it really takes to build a legacy that lasts. Catch you next time on Feeling Your Legacy.